to the virtual launch of Craig Higginson's latest novel. Let me show you the cover, just in case you haven't seen it. It's absolutely marvelous. And in fact, Craig, I think you took that cover photograph, didn't you? I did, lying at the swimming pool at the Oyster Box Hotel. Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment. So I'm absolutely delighted to be hosting this event. So thank you, Pan McMillan, for asking me. I'm Jenny Cruis williams and I can talk for hours and hours, but I'm not allowed to. So we're going to start chatting about the book right now, but do remember um, after the interview, which we've both been instructed to keep light, um, you'll be able to send questions by using the Q&A function wherever it is on your screen. And you'll also be able to say hello using the chat feature. And we are going to take questions afterwards. And do remember that the bookstores, thank goodness, are now open. And you can also order copies from exclusive books. And you can actually order a meal at the same time if you want to, because you just go to Uber Eats and you can order a pancake and a book at the same time. And the book has got to be this wonderful book by Craig Higginson. So Craig's book is called, uh, um, in fact, the previous books he's done, some of them, The Landscape Painter, The Dream House, which is really interesting uh, because um, it's the English matric book, uh, set book, 2019 to 2021, The White Room. I loved, I absolutely loved The Dream House. And, um, but let's talk about the book right now. And one reviewer, Craig, said, they found the book poignant and profound. So I was wondering how you would describe your novel. Poignant? Um, I don't, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know how to describe my novel. I don't, I don't know that it's terribly poignant. I mean, I think one has to sort of earn moments of poignancy, you know, so poignancy is maybe something you arrive at. Um, for me, it's, you know, for me, I try to, you know, I like this Iris Murdoch thing where she said she she wrote so that there was something for everyone. So I think there's a strong narrative drive. And then there's a lot going on thematically and um, sort of conceptually that you can kind of dig into if you choose to. Um, but well, in a way, it's, it's a sort of a family drama, I suppose. Um, well, for me, there were two main themes throughout this novel, almost from the very beginning. One is family, inescapably family, good, bad and ugly and it's a very tight-knit family. And, uh, and the other one is death. And, uh, and that begins almost in the background. And then it sort of gains momentum as well. And there was, there was a wonderful thing a little bit later on in the novel, about halfway through, where you were um, talking about uh, Johannesburg and even the trees, because they've got this terrible bug, uh, even the trees. And I, I actually pulled it out of the book. Um, they remain where they're pl planted gradually starved of water and weeping watery blood. I mean, it's actually quite dark, isn't it? And parts of the book I found very dark. Mm -hmm. But I think that for me, the, the momentum of the book, it begins right at the beginning, but because you're at the oyster box, and I should explain to everybody, the book is mostly set um, in KwaZulu-Natal at the oyster box, uh, because it keeps going backwards and forwards, and also in Johannesburg, a tiny bit in Mauritius. So, so how long did you stay at the Oyster Box and did you get it free? <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I mean, I actually went and visited when I was writing the novel. Um, I went and visited it because I just wrote a, a, a hotel sort of from my imagination. And then I thought, well, I better go. And it's not the Oyster Box. I mean, it's, it is a hotel of my own invention. So um, there was the old Oyster Box before they made it completely unaffordable. Um, and that had quite a jungly area in the back and a tennis court and so on. And I wanted to retain that um, in the new Oyster, my, my, you know, my version of Oyster Box, because I wanted, you know, I liked the sort of atmosphere of the old Oyster Box and that jungle and that tennis court. There was something very sort of 1950s about it. Um, so so I, I, what I always do with writing is I just write my own thing and then I test it against reality. I give myself the opportunity to imagine a thing and then I, I test it against the facts. Um, and then, I mean, actually when my, my wife turned um, well, actually, I won't say what birthday it was. It was a significant <laughs> <laughs> We went and stayed there for a weekend and it did cost an absolute fortune. And by then I'd written a couple of drafts of the novel, but that's when I took the photograph and, um, and I did find, I did feed in little details um, that, that are in the novel. Um, and there's one line where it was very, very sunny 
and then the next day it was very grey and only the swimming pool had the, the blue of the day before. It sort of carried the sunlight to the day before. Everything else was sort of grey, but it had all been so blue before. So those sort of fine little details that you notice um, from sitting there. Um, and I do apologize for Emma's child that is on the, on the cover because um, he was just lying by the pool. I was just sort of taking photographs with my phone really and later thought, oh gosh, that'd be a nice cover. Um, but I did make sure we rendered him completely unrecognizable and changed the color of his hair and his baggies and, and um, yeah, turned him into someone else. Well, he might just look and say, but that's my rib cage. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I want some royalties. But I actually want to go for everybody because the writing in this book is so lush. It is just, I keep thinking, if you had a book club evening and you were trying to pick out paragraphs or even sentences that you wanted to discuss, and I think you will. I mean, this one is as good as any of it, and it's on page one of the novel. That summer, his aunt gave him a new pair of swimming goggles. He sits on the edge of the hotel pool, the sound of the sea on the rocks below him, and lowers the goggles over his eyes, reducing the world to shades of blue. As he slides into the water, the light above and below the surface is given a new consistency. The lighthouse on the other side of the balustrade painted like a stick of candy cane, becomes a blue and purple tower, like an image recalled from a fairy tale. As the other swimmers float around him, their pale limbs bland and floundering, he hangs suspended underwater, the only creature with the gift of sight. And immediately I'm asking myself, did this boy, his name is Julian, did he have the gift of sight? Because somehow or other between this precocious 11 year old and later on in the book when he's 15, he, he, is, he is an unusual boy. Mm. I mean, th there are all these Freudian concepts that, that run and ripple through the novel. And, and you mentioned death earlier. Uh, and one of them is one of the sort of central conflicts in the novel is this conflict between what Freud called Eros and Thanatos, which is the life drive and the death drive. And the death drive in a way is sort of embodied in one of the characters, Jennifer. But there's also this Oedipal thread that runs all the way through the novel. And Oedipus, of course, blinds himself at the end of that Greek myth. Um, and, and so the novel is full of all these sort of mythic tropes to sound fancy, but it's got the images of blindness and vision and sight, images of, of, of flight and transcendence and falling, lots of, lots of angels and birds and, and broken wings and... Um, and, and swollen feet. And, I mean, I mean, I, I tried to sort of feed all these things in, uh, but without naming them. So, so Oedipus, for example, is never actually mentioned by name in the whole novel, even though it is a, a kind of Oedipal exploration of, of triangles that go up in lots of different directions. Well, you've got, to, you've got this uh, conflict immediately, um, although it doesn't manifest itself so much at the beginning of the novel, but it's an uneasy relationship between the two sisters. They're half sisters. And one of them has always had more than enough milk in her breasts and hair on her head. Now that's bitter. And uh, the other one never managed to make any babies and whose unwashed hair is threatening to fall out. And, uh, and th there's a sense of unease in the relationship that um, the sister, the one sister, Jennifer, who never managed uh, to make any babies and, uh, and her nephew, uh, because she holds uh, Julian before his mother holds him. And, and she's very possessive. And there is the sense of, there is the sense of unease, although on the surface, everything is shining and the sea looks absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the building up is, is so gradual that you don't realize. I have to say, Craig, I, re, I, I reread this book and I, I, I finished rereading it um, yesterday morning. And I noticed that from a page, about page 111, I was, I was driven to read the book. And you know when you get a book and you are desperate to get to the end, but you don't want it to end. When, when it's ended, you don't know quite what to do except eat, you know, eat bread or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I, I, I've been surprised at how compelling people have found it. I sort of forgot that really it was structured like a murder mystery. Um, you know, at near the beginning of the novel, Julian, at the age of 15, is lying in the ICU and, and the novel sort of moves backwards to try and find a kind of um, trigger event for, for what's happened to him and an explanation for what's happened. And um, it is sort of structured like a murder mystery, but 
a little bit like what I did with the dream house is I start with quite a, a tight traditional genre novel and then unravel it and, and dig up the human beings inside it and sort of restore them to their humanity and their complexity. So that hopefully you're and rewarded with a, 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 an experience that's plot driven, but also bigger than that, opens out into other areas. Yes, I mean, there, there, there is, the, the, the writing is so powerful. I mean, there's, I'm, I'm not sure what I should be saying or what I shouldn't be saying, because I don't want to give a single thing away. But there is one scene where a very distressed woman runs out of her house uh, and it is night. And, and she is so distressed. She doesn't know where she's going. She can't even hear sounds except the sounds in her head. She's disassociated from everything. She's filled with grief. She's filled with everything that you, you, you know, the, the emotions. And, and, and that's for me when the novel absolutely turned and all the little building up clues that have made me feel uneasy are there right in, right in my face. And also there's this discussion about witches. You were talking about angels. Beezy Bailey does angels like a lunatic, you know, and they've all got his face, by the way. And um, so he, he did his face and all the angels have got Beezy Bailey's face. I don't know if that's good or bad. What do you think? <laughs> don't say a word. <laughs> so, so, but in um, the artist, the artist is Emma and uh, she's got a studio um, in her house, but it's filled with these almost ghost-like figures because she, it, it, it's plaster and she wraps um, like bandages, wet bandages around these figures and they never really have faces. Uh, and they have got broken wings. So they're kind of like angels that are somehow rather trapped on earth and they never really manage to fly away. And if they dry out, they will just crack. So it, it's, there is a sense of something sinister in this and something that you know is kind of almost, it's not insubstantial, but it's almost claustrophobic actually. Mm. You know, that studio and those scenes. I mean, I think that one of the functions of literature is to, is to earn the light. And, and as a writer, I'm always trying to write my way towards the light. But, but you need to earn that. It can't be a, an easily won battle. Um, so I think I, I sometimes start in quite dark places, but not because I think they're destinations or, or, or places of value in themselves. But I think they, you know, I think if one can start in a place of darkness and write one's way towards the light, you're taking the reader on a, on a journey that's hopefully a form of sustenance in a way. You know what I mean? It, um, so it, it does have all these dark nightmare images and, and sort of terrible events. Um, but that that scene the way you describe the person running to the city, it's 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 its title is is flickering light, and she's really moving towards towards light. Um, at the end of, of this sort of tunnel of, of um, it's almost, yeah, well, the, the fugue state. It's almost like a dissociated sort of fugue state. Um, yes. And I, just, I sort of noticed that with all my novels, recently I only noticed this, I, I, my, I always work my way towards a sort of a, a state of madness with at least one of my characters where the language becomes poetry and, and sort of, lifts away from prose and lifts away from sort of referentiality and, and plot and, and it becomes about the place of language and, and, and dissociation and, and I suppose I'm always trying to kind of break things up and, and break them open so that, that we can form new connections and, and re-engage in some sort of way. I was, I was interested in what you were saying a little bit earlier on about um, you, you, set, you set the book in a hotel that wasn't the oyster box, but the swimming pool, damn it, is the oyster box and the lighthouse is the oyster box and, and everything. But, but the writing of Julian, who then is, a, I think, a very precocious 11-year-old who adores his mum and his aunt certainly adores him. Um, and he sits with her the whole time. Um, it is so like, it just took me back to holidays on the South Coast, where the sun blisters your shoulders, um, where you end up peeling, you know, when you used to peel, and we, you know, half of us have got skin cancer, not myself, but touch wood. But you know that the, the carefreeness of youth and the, 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 the boy just swimming in that limpid swimming pool. And I don't think I'm going to destroy anything if I say that he does meet this 
girl who's a little bit older than him and that it's his first love affair and and you can almost smell the wannabe sex except there isn't sex it, it is so carefree and so not innocent but he is innocent and it, it it's really really interesting and then of course comes comes a terrible shock and everything shatters in shards of well, i don't know shards of glass fallen angels i mean it's you know, you mentioned the family. You know, for me, the, the novel is very much about the world of the the adults. You know, this what, what the novel calls the architecture of adults that Julian slips through and and negotiates himself around and and hides inside at times. Um, Julian is the sort of opaque center at the heart of the novel. He's a sort of uh, a, a mystery, um, and these adults who are around him. The novel is really trying to explore what their relationships are and, and how Julian, like a sort of tons, tonsil, absorbs the poison that is existing between these adults and the consequences of that. Um, but yeah, interestingly, yeah, I, I mean, it, I had to have that beginning bit because when I first wrote the novel, I didn't have the oyster box in Klanger section. And um, it just started with the Johannesburg section and then it went backwards and these adults were arguing and it was very dark and I thought no one's ever going to want to read this novel. I mean, why would they? You know, these people are dreadful. Everything, nothing, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing lovely. And then a year or so later when I picked it up again, I, I started in a much brighter, more beautiful place. And, and, and that I, becomes the kind of thread that tries to find its way back into the novel, I suppose. Yes, and I, I, and I mean, it is, I think that, that innocence actually captivates you almost, at the, well, it does, it captivates you at the very beginning. And this, mm -hmm. this mad crush that Julian has on this slightly older girl, who's certainly more worldly wise than he is, but he actually develops into this, he, he is, and for a 15 year old to be aware of what he is aware of is really quite astounding. And his change from this innocent boy to this resentful teenager, deeply resentful, deeply angered, and yet he's able to see things with clarity. And the, the whole thing of Julian writing um, essays, I suppose, that his teachers find so disturbing um, that they can't even talk about it to his mother uh, because she's remote from everything. But he's disassociating, is that also Freudian? Yes. Um, I mean, I think one of the most damaging things for children is when the world of adults intrudes into their world too early. I think one of our, and this is one of the things the novel's about, is the responsibility of, of adults to create a framework around children that protects them. But that framework also can't be a cage that imprisons them. You know, that, that one has to provide this safe space, but also the freedom for them to move within it and, and, and define themselves in the way they they kind of want to define themselves. Um, but yes, I mean, this, there's this, this essay that Julian writes, which is full of all sorts of Freudian things. Um, mm -hmm. And I wasn't sort of even that aware of it. I mean, I, I wrote the novel and then later took it to clinical psychologists and psychotherapists and asked them to sort of comment on it. And apparently sort of fantasies around, around fire are, are, um, are something that's very and dream, sort of violent dreams of gore. It's, it's a very borderline thing. It's a very eatable thing. Um, and, and, and I mean, it happened in my last novel, The White Room, where I, I, without knowing it, I wrote a relationship between a sort of anti-social personality disorder person and a borderline personality disorder person without even knowing this terminology. And I think writers write their way into these things because we're using archetypes. I mean, there's towers in the novel all over the place. There's the the chapel tower at school, there's the, the Hillbrow Tower, there's the lighthouse, and there's, there's oceans and there's rivers and there's, there's images of water and tides. And, and obviously that, those are kind of traditionally male, female archetypes that I was kind of drawing on and using that connect with all sorts of things in psychoanalysis, which I'm half the time wasn't even that aware of. And, and I think that's the beauty of it, of it is, is that as a fiction writer, you, you're writing into the symbolic and the archetypal, the totemic, and, and none of us have a full understanding of those things, but, but it's almost like you, you bring them to life and then they do their own work. Um, so yes, that essay of Julian's is full of all sorts of eatable triangles and replacement mothers and, and, and parents that are killed off and you know, all sorts of things, and, but, but it's, it's, it's sort of under the surface and it's there for you to, to dig them up if you feel 
inclined to. Were you surprised when you took it to the psychologist and, and they came, I mean, did you surprise yourself? Because you weren't really writing with, um, with the knowledge of it being um, a disorder of some kind. I mean, I did, from the outset, I, I wasn't aware that I was writing this, this quite Freudian psych, psych, you know, this world that is bringing these Freudian concepts to life. Because I mean, the novel is all about gift giving and gift receiving. And there is this concept in Freudian psychoanalysis, which is called the unholy exchange, which comes from Freud's Dora case, where a father was having a relationship with a married woman, and he unconsciously allowed his daughter or to have a, a, a relationship with the jilted husband, the woman he, he was having an affair with, if, you, if that makes sense. So it was this terrible abusive relationship that was incredibly damaging to this girl, who was kind of handed over as a kind of compensation, compensatory sort of gift unconsciously by the father and it's called the unholy exchange given giving over one forbidden thing in order to get another forbidden thing and i thought that was a very rich and interesting concept starting point for a novel and, and so the, the novel is all about gift giving and receiving and and what the cost of giving a, a gift is and what the cost of receiving a gift is and and each chapter is you know given the name of an object that's given as or bartered in some sort of way whether it's a pair of red high heel shoes or or sushi or a chocolate cake or whatever it might be, these things that are given and received um, in compensation for other things. Um, but the novel's also trying to kind of get beyond that sort of nightmare of, of the unconscious and, and, and find a space where there, there are real, valid, valuable connections, that there is such a thing as a disinterested gift. Uh, and as Andrew, who's the psychotherapist in the novel, points out to one of his patients, you know, mothers give their children hundreds and thousands of gifts all the time um, that are just sort of taken for granted. You know, every pair of shoes they ever wear, and every meal they ever eat, and every plaster that goes on every cut, and these thousands of, of acts of giving and, and receiving that, that happen. And we tend to fixate as human beings on, on the one gift that was withheld or the gift that was given to someone else and, 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 and fixate around that thing, almost like a site of trauma, and define ourselves against that lack. And I suppose the novel's trying to kind of, again, restore the, the abundance of the world back to the characters so that they hand themselves over to the bigger thing. Well, I want to change tack just a little bit because Blow Me Down, um, in, in the um, kitchen of the Johannesburg house where Julian lives with his mum, Emma, uh, and she is the one who has got lots of hair and she's managed to push out a baby. And, uh, and she is making, probably for the first time in her life, what she hopes is going to be the first successful birthday cake for him. It's his birthday. And, uh, and she's done it over the years, but she's absent-minded. And she walks into another room and forgets about the cake, which will burn or flop or, and are so disgusting that people who come for his birthday party can't eat it. But he does because he doesn't want to upset his mother. Now, the rumor is that you actually, in a very uh, laconic kind of a way, have given an entire recipe, which would take, I would actually quickly write it out. You think that that recipe works because I haven't had time to try it. And I do know who's given you the recipe. So I will be knocking on her door um, yes. if it doesn't work. Now, tell us about this recipe. It doesn't work. Yes, so, so the, the, the chef behind it is Andrew Bergen from The Leopard um, and they've got a lovely shop in Delhi in, in Randstein, Johannesburg and also at Stanley Avenue. Um, and I actually went to Andrea's house and she made the cake in front of me and, and we wrote down all the ingredients and absolutely everything that you have to do. And I did later send her the chapter and said, you know, is, is everything, are all the ingredients and all the temperatures and, and everything in there. Um, and a friend of mine did actually make the cake from the novel. Um, you've, got to, you've got to read quite carefully because sometimes yes, you do. <laughs> the, the bit of information is planted, you know, earlier on in the, on the, end of the chapter without you noticing. So you have to read carefully. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's quite nice if you can, and we did that at the book launch. Uh, well, we had two book launches, one at St. John's College, where I'm teaching at the moment, and one at, um, at, um, at Love Books. And we, we, Andrea made the cake for um, those book launches and, and the people who came were able to taste them. And it's a rather lovely cake. It's sort of, it's quite sticky. It's almost like a, 
um, like a brownie, it's sort of got a brownie thing going, going on with it, but um, completely <laughs> delicious. So, well, so but read, it read, it read it carefully, don't you? Yeah. So, so listen, we, we are almost at the end of our time. So if anybody wants to ask questions, please put them up because we'll see them. And we've got time to answer some of the questions as well. And, but I, I mean, I don't want to, to um, destroy any of the secrets of this book. But what for you was the most, what, was, what for you was the easiest scene to write? That you just, you just sort of lost your way, you know, you just fell into that scene and realized how much you were enjoying it. I, I love the scene where the character runs into the city. I love writing that. Um, and I often find, you know, with the dream house, I loved writing Richard, the, the character's got dementia. I loved his sections the most. It's just because it, it, was, it was fun finding a language to, to kind of match the texture of the consciousness of, of, you know, of, of the character. I think the hardest scene to write was when Andrew, the uncle, is talking to Julia, his, his nephew, because Andrew is a, a trained psychotherapist and we're inside his head and he's talking to this relative. So as an analyst, you know, professionally, he would never, he would never be talking to his nephew mm -hmm. as an analyst, but his mom, you know, Julia's mom wants him to talk to him as, a, as an uncle, not as an analyst, but of course, Andrew finds it very hard to do that. So, that's that scene of blurred boundaries and what he's thinking, what he's saying, and how he asks the questions. That just took a lot of. I had to. I had to have quite a few goes at it and get a lot of advice around it because, although Andrew's not a brilliant psychotherapist, it also had to feel credible. Um, so, so that was you know sometimes you have a character with a kind of a specialized knowledge, and you want to kind of put that in, but you don't want it, your research to kind of draw attention to itself. It needs to feel completely natural and organic. So. That took a little bit of writing. Um, I also loved writing the beginning sections, you know, where Julian is young and falling in love, hanging out at the oyster box. And mm. I sort of wanted to stay there forever, really. Um, I might just write myself a novel one day where it just happens at, at a really lovely hotel. I mean, there's this beautiful hotel in the Lido, Venice, where Thomas Mann wrote Death in Venice, and I visited it once. And I mean, just is the, the most beautiful hotel in the world. It's just one of those old style, grand, with this beach, you know, that, with these chairs, it's just perfect, it's a lovely veranda. And I, I think I'd, I'd like to just write a novel, just sit there one day, just so I can sort of dwell there for a bit. But, but maybe I won't have anything horrible happen. But, you know, unfortunately something horrible does have to happen, otherwise. <laughs> it's just- <laughs> You might have some sort of walking past you. Yeah, it gets you know. sort of immediately forgettable, you know, if, if you don't put in a bit of grit. Well, there's lots of grit in this. It is just the most astonishing read. So everyone, I'm going to show you the cover again. And here it is. So it's very, very easily recognized. And, uh, and it is um, on sale right now. It is available everywhere. But let's see if we've got some questions. And I am going to go to Q&A. So we've got a question here. And this comes from Natasha. Uh, Natasha, how do you pronounce your surname? Lutjebur, I hope. Um, how do you know when you're done with a story that it's ready to be shared with the world? Uh, Natasha, that's a great question. Um, W.H. Auden wrote somewhere the poet, he said, a poem is never finished, it's only ever abandoned. Um, and I think you can, with a, with a work of literature, keep tinkering away with it forever. Um, and I think, I think what happens for me is, is I do lots of drafts and I go through the manuscript many, many times, but it gets to the point where it feels like the thing you've written is sort of pushing you out of it. It sort of gets at a kind of an internal life. And, um, and, and after a while, you kind of feel that you can't really make more of a contribution, that, that you've done for it what you can. It's a bit like a child, I suppose, bringing up a child. You know, you, 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 you help it with, with its homework and you try and teach it to ride a bicycle, which takes months and you never think it's going to happen and eventually it does. Um, and then eventually they go off into the world and, and, and you feel you've done what you can do. Um, the deadlines are great. I mean, you know, I'm a theatre person as well, or certainly have been. Um, and, you know, you have an opening night and, you know, you have to be ready by that night. And, and, and whatever, you've, whatever you've got to give is, is what you give. Um, but I think that often we, we, we do rush things as well. It's really important to, to spend time with something that you're writing because 
every time you sit down, something happens and it gets enriched in a new way. And I think if we rattle through it, the result is often quite thin. So I, I think, yeah, you also get sick of it after a while, to be honest, and want to, want to just work on something new. Um, but you have to, yeah, you have to work until you do get sick of it. Natasha, nice question. And here's one from Andrea Gerling. Gifts equals fruits from spirit, question mark? Um, you know, Andrew, the psychotherapist, his, his way of, um, of, of analyzing and understanding someone's um, identity and their character is through trying to look at the series of objects that they had relationships with from, from birth till the present moment. So, you know, as a baby, one of the first objects they have a relationship with is, is the mother's breast, for example, or the mother's heartbeat even before they're born. Um, we have these things that are, that are outside that we enter into a relationship with, and the breast gets replaced by the concept of the mother and then, the, you know, then the concept of the father and truth comes in and the, the concept of the home. And then we, you know, we move from object to object to object. So a lot of babies have a, a little blankie that they hold onto or a dummy or, you know, these replacement objects. So for my sort of thinking of gifts in the novel, for much of it was about objects and how objects are given and exchanged. So they were, they were external things that we have relationships with rather than things of the spirit. Um, and yet, I mean, interestingly, the novel becomes increasingly about spirituality. And, you know, there's a scene that happens in a chapel and, and the, the characters are wondering whether God is there and, and what he needs to do to get God's attention. Um, and I am finding that, that I'm drawn more and more to writing about the magic that runs through all things that you know the, the inexplicable spirit that animates life and, and what that is and and how we can give space to that in our lives you know i don't mean a, a necessarily christian vision of the world but but a, sp more, a more spiritual one um and i and I, I do believe in ill will and goodwill and and i think that when someone enters a room they have a kind of a spirit to them that that, that has a meaning and, and um and so I think, I think one good spiritedness or, or goodwill can be a kind of a gift to the world. And I think it can ripple through the world and create enormous good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it can be a, a form of gift, but it took me a long time. I had to write a whole novel in order to get to that place that you're talking about. Let's go to Aisha Kaji. Hi, Aisha. Um, now, I'm even more upset that I was in quarantine during the Love Books launch. That cake sounds scrumptious. Well, you can go along to the Leopard and buy it, I, I suspect. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, you might have to order it. it. You'd have to order it. We'll make it for you with pleasure. But, yeah, just, just go halfway through the book and you can make it yourself. Uh, and Craig, another hotel you need to visit is the Old Cataract in Aswan, where Death on the Nile is set. So that, yeah. that also has a certain feel to it. This is anonymous. Uh, do you find it easy to cross mediums, plays to novels, etc.? Um, I'm more and more writing novels, um, less and less writing plays. Um, and I, I used to find I, I would I would get a bit of an escape from you know when I moved from one form to another form. Um, you know, novels were quite um, solitary, and plays are quite collaborative. And I'd be doing readings and work with actors and work with directors. Um, and my plays initially were quite political, sort of more socially engaged. My, my novels were kind of more private and more idiosyncratic. And I think I've, since the, the, book, the, the Dream House, I've kind of swished that around and, and messed, messed up that, that kind of difference. Um, but the, my last couple of novels have been plays originally, and then I've sort of written them as novels. Uh -huh. uh, so I don't, I don't find it hard. It's, it's sort of, it's, it's a very different thing. It's, it's, it, it exercises a different part of you. Um, I think I much prefer writing novels to plays because, because novels, you know, you live with for a couple of, of years and, um, and you inhabit them and you dwell with them. Whereas plays, you kind of visit, write a draft, leave it alone, visit, write a draft. And, it's, and, and you're really trying to take almost everything out of the play until there's almost nothing left. Whereas novels thrive from having lots of things put into them. Um, but I mean, writing is difficult, and, and each time it's difficult for a new for a new reason, because the you know the sort of formal um, discoveries you made 
in the in the previous one don't help you with the new one because the new one comes with a whole new set of challenges so writing is difficult but i, I, I think that's one of the things i really enjoy about it because each time it's it's challenging and you have to stretch yourself and try something new um here's uh, nancy richards hi nancy um, I missed the start, so forgive if covered or impertinent. How could you be impertinent? Uh, but have you spent time in psychotherapy yourself to glean some understanding, some inside knowledge? I haven't had one minute of therapy in my whole life. Um, and I, I'm sure I ought to have and would have benefited from it, but I never have. Um, and yeah, so, so, but I've always been fascinated by it. And I was even reading Freud. I mean, it sounds potential, but I actually was reading Freud while at school. And I left school wanting to be a, a psychologist. And I remember I was standing in the queue at Wits and they had this thing called diagonals. And psychology and history of art were the same diagonal. And you weren't allowed to do both. And I was, I'd loved history of art at school. And I thought, well, I'm not, not doing history of art. So I gave up being a psychologist there and then. Um, and then about the age of 19, decided I, I wanted to be a writer. And, um, and I think I've really been a psychologist my whole life, really. I think there's, I think that, I think writing and, and therapy have a lot in common. And I think I've been at, in therapy through writing. I mean, I don't think one should write as therapy, but I think you are consciously or not working through all sorts of issues and all sorts of recurring um, things that, that only much later do you look back and, and see that they were there all along, um, you know, once not necessarily aware of them. I also had this feeling that if I went to therapy, I wouldn't have anything to write about, you know, because I'd get too healthy and I'd sort of have all my problems fixed. But that was, that's probably a young person's view of it. I think as one gets older, you realize that the world is kind of inexhaustible and you're never going to run out of things to write about. Were you at any stage, I mean, I know I'm not supposed to be doing this, but were you at any stage writing about yourself as, as Julian? Uh, because in an interview that you gave uh, somebody, you, you sounded distant from your parents, or your parents weren't terribly uh, concerned about what career you were going to have. It, it seemed like a distant relationship from your response. And there is that that comes into the book. Were, were, are there elements of you in that? Um, a little bit. I, I think that there's an element of, of me and each of the characters. You know, they're like figures in a dream. You know, when you have a dream, you dream about these other people, but they're not really other people. It's, it's really all about your perceptions of those people or what those people throw out inside you. You're not actually dreaming about those, those people as they exist in the world. You're only really dreaming about your, your own psychic content, is, you know. So I think they are all, um, but as I get older, I kind of feel that the shreds that I draw from um, are less and less to do with my own personal life. Um, you know, for me, the central relationship in this novel is between the two sisters. And, you know, I've never been um, a sister with a sister, um, you know, so I've never had that relationship, but that is the central relationship in the novel. Um, I don't think my mom was anything like Julian's mom because Julian's mom is an artist. So she, she's very remote. And then, and then when she's present, she's overcompensating. Um, I think my mom was, was more of a, a mother of her generation where, you know, we sort of were left to play in the traffic. I mean, she literally told my sister to once go and play in the traffic when my sister was about four and, and she did go and play in the traffic. And was oh. the fun the <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah. So no, right. it's not autobiographical in any direct way, but, but I think it's autobiographical in all sorts of underground ways. Let's go to Arja Salafranca. Um, ever thought of writing short stories? I've only written short stories when I've been asked to. Um, and uh, funny enough, the, the, the Mauritius section was a short story that I wrote for Playboy magazine at the request of, of Karina uh, Brink. And, um, and then I think it was published in Playboy magazine, but they never paid me. But um, I always liked that, um, that scene. And I, and, and, um, and then I, I recently wrote a short story for another anthology, which was published, I think it was late last year, and I just reused that story in the, the thing that I'm writing now. So, I mean, I'd love to write short stories. I'd love to write poems, but I, I, you know, what's nice about a novel is it's a big project and you sit down every morning and you know what, what section you're gonna be working on next. And it's all sorts of, you know what I mean? It's all mapped out for you. Whereas, whereas a short story or a poem requires something else different giving yourself a different kind of freedom, I think, to, to write things. Um, 
But yeah, I would like to write short stories. P people usually start off writing short stories. I started off writing poems. Um, and I suppose, yeah, I mean, I loved Ulysses, James Joyce novel when I was a student. And I love that idea that you could write highly poetic prose um, and a sort of interiority in prose that, that felt like poetry. And, and, and so I've been trying to do that in a way. In a way, it feels like I've, I've been writing forms of poetry, sort of narrative poems in a way, through plays and novels. Um, yeah. Let's go to Judith uh, Shopley. Uh, I love the imagery of the lighthouse. Remember the Keeper by Marguerite Poland. Is there a particular significance? Yes, so I'm aware of that novel and I actually didn't read it because I didn't want it to interfere with my lighthouse in any way. So I think I, I, I will and I should. But yes, I mean, the, the tower is very much a, a symbol of, 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 of someone trying to transcend the everyday and go up literally into a kind of ivory tower. It's an image of transcendence, of leaving the world behind and, and possibly aspects of oneself behind. Um, and, and literature is full of, and the novel is full of images of, of overreaching and, and, and then falling and of Icarus and flying too close to the sun. Mm. Um, and there is obviously something quite phallic about the tower. tower. Mm. And I don't believe that men and women are essentially different, but I do believe that there are archetypes of masculinity and femininity that, that run through us and that we, we draw identity from in some ways or relate to, have relationships with, um, yeah. Hamilton and Wendy, uh, who lives around the corner. Uh, so tell us how making up the hotel has to change the story when you go to the real hotel. What, what's the question exactly, Tony? I don't quite understand. Um, so, what's he asking? So tell us how making up the hotel, because you, you hadn't been to the hotel mm. when, you, when you wrote the initial, that initial chapter. Uh, yeah. How did you change the story when you go to the real hotel? So it didn't really change the story, it just, just lots of little details found their way in. Um, I mean, I wrote this novel called The Landscape Painter, which had all these um, scenes of the Battle of Spionkop. Um, and that was interesting because I wrote, I wrote about it before visiting the actual place. And then when I went there, it was completely different from how I'd imagined it. So I completely rewrote it hmm. then. Um, but um, I mean, apart from, you know, I'd read Churchill and Dennis Rates and all these people, but, you know, no one had talked about the view, for example. I mean, it's an extraordinary view from the top of Spionkop and, and, and just what the, what the plants and the, and the animals and the insects are doing at that time of year, because I went at the same time of year as my scene was set, so I could see what was happening in nature. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I do believe that the novels are, are, are acts of the imagination and, and that we, yeah, I'm not sure I could ever really write nonfiction or something that was pretending to be the truth because I think that's so impossible. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I put in, you know, the macaroons and I put in the cats and I, from the oyster box, I, you know, there, there were little, little, little details that I put in, um, but it didn't change the story. I, I, the story was kind of pretty, pretty much set. And I had spent a lot of time at the Oyster Box. Well, not a lot of time, but I've been there a few times as a kid with my mom and my sister. Um, so I had memories of the Oyster Box and the tennis court and the, the forest at the back. Um, and I suppose I wanted to honor that remembered hotel and give that space um, and not let the, the new one with its extraordinary tower blocks behind it now sort of get in the way. Um, mm. And it's much more manicured, of course. I mean, I yeah. love that wildness of the... Of yes. the old oil box, and you could sit yeah. there and watch porpoises in the waves and things, mm. you know, it was lovely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. final question, Marianne uh, Wolf. Uh, what inspired this particular book, and what was the experience of working on a novel as part of a PhD? So, The Dream House was my PhD novel, um, and so this one wasn't part of any kind of degree. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the novel came from lots of different places. I mean, one was this, I, I don't know if you heard, if you were in the conversation, Mary, when we were talking about the unholy exchange, this idea of gift giving and gift receiving. Um, I, I was working on it as a play for a while, it was called The Red Door. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's hard to really know where, where it sort of comes from. You know, I, I live with, with ideas for novels for, for lots of 
years before beginning to write them down. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a long process. I mean, I think as a writer, one gets lots and lots of ideas. And the ones that stay are the ones that you end up writing, you know, the ones that keep coming back and sort of insisting on a life. Um, and, and, and I'm not quite sure why I, I needed to write this novel. I mean, interesting, the one I'm working on at the moment is all about death. So although it's not about Corona in any direct way, this sort of mortality and this the atmosphere that, that we're all living in and the fragility of everything is finding its way it's directly into the book. And the book is all about, this one's called The Book of Gifts. The thing I'm writing now could easily be called The Book of Death because it's all just about, about death, but also trying to, it's like the gift thing, just trying to sort of write my way towards life and towards light and not just getting stuck in, in, in death and darkness. Um, but yeah. Craig, this has been such a lovely conversation, which we could have continued for hours, but we can't. So thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, I've so really much. enjoyed it. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It's um, lovely to share a space with you when we're all in our little isolated spaces. So thank you for coming. No, it's, it's lovely. And it, it, it's kind of like family. And uh, don't forget that Pam will post the links in the chat and you'll also get an email the day after the launch with a link to the recording and all the details to buy your copy. Uh, so Pam will post the links in the chat and you'll also get an email um, with a link to the recording and all the details to buy your copy. <coughs> Excuse me, also on YouTube. Thank you so much.